great to see a nice turnout here. And I see especially a lot of current and former students. So we're very happy to see that. A lot of folks from the School of Architecture and some people I don't recognize, uh, which is even better. Uh, so welcome to uh, this year's Patterson Lecture. Uh, my job here is a very easy one. I introduce other people and they do all the work. So uh, but I will start off by uh, welcoming Dr. Robert Stanton uh, to the School of Architecture and thanking him again for coming today uh, and honoring us with your remarks. Thank you very much. And that's pretty much it. Now I'm going to introduce Dean Don Leinwald, who will come up and make some remarks, and we'll go from there. Great. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, so on behalf of the University of Maryland's Historic Preservation Program and the entire faculty of the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, I'd like to welcome everyone this evening to the Spring 2020 Marvin Breckenridge Patterson Lecture. It's a great pleasure to have all of you with us this evening uh, and to see, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Pogue said, such a, a wide variety of folks from from different places coming out to hear this uh, lecture tonight. And again, let me add uh, to Dennis's welcome to uh, the uh, director, uh, Director Stanton, and uh, I think we all really greatly look forward to your presentation tonight. The Marvin Breckenridge Patterson Lecture was established through a generous gift from Mrs. Patterson in 1998 to support an annual lecture on historic preservation. Born of priv privilege, Mrs. Patterson dropped her given name of Mary and under the name of Marvin Breckenridge, studied photography, cinematography, and journalism. Interestingly, her cousin, also known as Mary Breckenridge, was the founder of the Frontier Nursing Service, which was started in Kentucky, and she was the subject of Marvin Breckenridge's acclaimed first silent movie in 1930. I'm sure all of you have seen that. <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay. I, I, yeah, I knew that. Okay. So Marvin Breckenridge eventually uh, worked as a freelance journalist and CBS broadcaster in Europe during World War II. And she was hired by Edward R. Murrow and was one of the first women correspondents to cover the war. In 1940, she married Foreign Service Officer, uh, officer Jefferson Patterson and had to end her career in journalism due to State Department restrictions on the employment of wives in the diplomatic service. In addition to endowing uh, our lecture, Mrs. Patterson is also known for her generous gift of Jefferson Patterson Park to the state of Maryland. Uh, the park is the home to the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab and contains over 80 archaeological sites and is just a beautiful uh, place to go if you haven't been there. And incidentally, Patterson's home at the park was designed by the pioneering woman architect Gertrude Sawyer. Uh, and she was em employed in the Washington, D.C. office of architect Horace Peasley. And uh, she was hired by Jefferson Patterson in 1932 to design the residence and farm buildings at the site. Her work eventually included 26 buildings and I like this, from the elegant colonial revival home to a chicken house. So there you go. Before Dr. John Sprinkle, who is adjunct professor of historic preservation and bureau historian for the National Park Service, introduces our speaker, I just want to thank several people who made tonight possible. Chris Inahosa and Yelena uh, Dakovic coordinated the, co uh, coordinated the publicity for tonight's event. And Laura Stieg, our dynamic HIST program assistant. Laura, where are you? Back there. <laughs> Provided the support that really made all of this happen, including the great food you had earlier. So without further ado, let me introduce John Sprinkle. my distinct privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Robert G. Stanton, who is the 15th director of the National Park Service. Your program, which is excellently designed, I believe, it, indeed, it contains a, a, a 
beautiful description of his long career and his distinguished accomplishments, which I'm not going to repeat for you right now, except to highlight a little known chapter in his tenure with the National Park Service. Uh, from my personal perspective, Director Stanton's most significant accomplishment was as a patron of historical research. It all began in 2000 with the completion of a national study of sites associated with the movement to desegregate public schools across the United States, a story that is part of his own family history. As a result, on May 17, 2004, the 50th anniversary of the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court decision, the National Park Service could point to the designation of five new National Historic Landmarks that enhanced and expanded upon the story told at Topeka's Monroe School and Little Rock's Central High School National Historic Sites. This initial work, this, this little seed, resulted in the most unusual congressional directive to study, quote, civil rights sites multi-state. Well, we didn't know what that meant. But which Director Stanton encouraged us to think of this as a broad mandate to look at the origins and impact of the pivotal 1964 Civil Rights Movement, or Civil Rights Act. Since this initial work, the agency has completed more than a dozen national studies, each one expanding the envelope of the kinds of historic places um, that thought worthy of conservation, stewardship, and interpretation, uh, in a substantial way, reshaping the national park system. The hard work of historical identification and evaluation he supported was vital as the foundation for studies of, among other things, among other subjects, Latino heritage, Asian American Pacific Islanders, and the LGBTQ community. Without Director Stanton's leadership, it is doubtful that the National Park Service would have advocated for the then controversial designation in 2000 of New York City Stonewall, which President Obama elevated to the elite status as a national monument in 2016. Without the basic re historic research Director Stanton supported, we would not have sites that comm commemorate Harry Tubman, Charles Young, Carter Woodson, Cesar Chavez, and the Freedom Riders. Now, some of you may know him or come to know him as Bob, but for me, he will always be Director Stanton, a quiet patron of American Historic Preservation. Director Stanton. Good afternoon. Good evening. In one of those days. John, let me uh, thank you for your very kind introduction. Dean, through your illustrious staff, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. It is absolutely amazing about the human mind and the human body. For just to be in your midst and see how enthusiastic you are about this noble endeavor that we call historic preservation has literally taken 20, 30, 40 years of my life. I feel young, okay, <laughs> just to be with you. So you honor me by your presence here this evening. It would be difficult to refrain from sharing all of my experiences spread over a period of 57 years when I was first introduced to the National Park Service as a seasonal ranger in Grand Teton National Park, Wyoming. But when conferring with uh, John, I uh, posed the question, what did he think would be an appropriate topic or topics that I might touch upon this evening? He said, Bob, I uh, realize that uh, you're old. <laughs> I think he said that. <laughs> so you can go way back in history and share a number of things. And certainly I know your love for the national parks 
and the programs of the National Park Service. And he said, but Bob, I know most of all you are a proud Texan. Now, normally when I say I'm a proud Texan, people stand up and applaud. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and for this occasion, Bob, I want you to exercise without fail those two innate characteristics for which all native Texans are known. That's humility and brevity, and not necessarily in that order. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I will try to be brief. And I am indeed humble for the opportunity to be with you this evening. I must also confess that there are none of you in the audience who know as if you were a living encyclopedia more about historic preservation and the national parks and the parks of than I do. Uh, so I'm a little intimidated by that. But I will do my best. I think Dr. LaRoche here, Shirley John, and the Dean, and it's Kubo, who heads up the preservation code, who heads up the preservation program, authorities on the importance of preservation of parks. But I too must confess that just the interaction that I've had with many of you at the reception it has sort of influenced me to change the direction a wee bit of, uh, of my remarks. When I received the very kind invitation to be with you, I reflected on what I might offer as some food for thought. Not any practical considerations or ideas about architecture, historic preservation, planning but really sort of a philosophical underpinning that should be the basis of our life's work. Because if one have a philosophical embracement of something, practical approaches, practical solutions normally fall into place. But I think it would be mutually beneficial to establish briefly a common framework, a common reference, if you will, about the National Park System and the National Park Service. And then from, late, then from that, speak about the accomplishments and certainly the ongoing challenges to reserve the richness of our diverse collective heritage. Starting with, I believe, of the springs in Arkansas that predated the establishment of the first national park, the concept of a national park, first established not only here in the United States, but indeed, throughout the world, with Yellowstone in 1872. And the idea of having land set aside preserved for all people caught on, even in the midst of recovering from one of the most defining periods in our collective history that we know as the U.S. Civil War. Parks still begin, begin to be recognized, established. So from Yellowstone up until August 25, 1916, 34 parks were established. Primarily the large natural areas that we know as Mount Rainier, Yosemite, Sequoia, Kings Canyon, Yellowstone National Park, and other. So concern grew on the part of uh, a number of prominent leaders that the American people perhaps see that there's something magical about parks 
the parks will continue to be authorized. And perhaps there should be one agency that would have the responsibility of regulating these parks, guarding these parks, providing for public access to these parks. So lo and behold, these voices were heard, and they were heeded in the halls of Congress. And Congress, in its wisdom, passed legislation signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson, August 25, 1916. Established and as a bureau within our beloved Department of the Interior, the National Park Service. So when the Park Service came on the scene in 1916, it already had a portfolio. But when the Park Service was established, would soon thereafter enter into World War I, and things slowed down. And as World War II ended and we began to come together again as a nation and to recognize some of our domestic needs, the Roosevelt administration, Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration, had appointed a young visionary director for the Park Service, the second director in our history, the name of Stan Albright. Morris Albright, Stan Albright was a nephew who was one of my And he approached President Roosevelt that, you know, we manage all these large natural areas, primarily out west. But I'm confident that if not today, tomorrow, the Park Service would have the capacity to expand this portfolio to preserve those areas that represent not only our natural, but our cultural heritage. A very persuasive director. President Roosevelt said, yes, Director Albright, we can do this. So when President Roosevelt was considered a major reorganization of the executive branch, which culminated in terms of the Reorganization Act of the Executive Branch in 1933, that act authorized probably in the neighborhood of 55 to 60 areas, monuments, moral, battle sites, Statue of Liberty, parks in Washington, D.C., administered by other entities to be placed under the jurisdiction of the National Parks. So with a stroke of a pen, the Park Service had 60 new areas to be administered. Great, great. So we moved from that again into World War II. And things slowed down because most of our resources and energies were directed towards the war. And World War II, as we all know, was soon followed by the Korean War, the Korean conflict. That too slowed us down in terms of best. So as we moved from that period into the 50s, things were beginning to come into shape again. But our society had changed, representation in Congress had changed, and there was an interest in looking at whether or not there is diversity, there is inclusion, in fact, in terms of those areas that we administer and the people who administer them. So that was the beginning of a great change. And that great change continued to increase as we moved into the 50s and the 60s the height of the Civil Rights Movement. People were arguing that under the Constitution of the United States, there are certain things that are being denied. We want our privilege, our guaranteed privilege. People in the urban community said that we may not have the wherewithal to make a long trip to Yosemite or Sequoia King Canyon. Maybe the government has some responsibility to meet our outdoor recreational needs in the large urban areas. So in 1972, we did see an increase in Park Service presence in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Cuyahoga between Akron and Cleveland, all national recreation areas. And then we moved into really a close examination of John Mitchell. Are we, in fact, preserving the richness of the American people? 
all of the American people. So today, my friends, your National Park Service administers 419 areas from American Samoa to Maine, from Alaska to the U.S. Virgin Islands, representing the richness of this great country. That is your National Park system. But that's not all the American people became a little bit more confident about the capacity of the Park Service to administer resources beyond the national parks. So the Park Service administered the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Historic Preservation Fund, the National Register of Historic Places, and many, many other areas, heritage areas. It's a great challenge, but it's great beauty. Just briefly about the organization of the Park Service itself. The Organic Act of August 25, 1916 clearly states that the Bureau will be under the direction of the Director. It is the Director of the Park Service who is daily accountable to the Secretary of the Interior, to the President of the United States, and to the American people as to what takes place in Alaska, in the Virgin Isles, in Washington, D.C. The law said that there is a director. So if something goes wrong, well, it wasn't my responsibility. Are not you the director? The law said you are responsible. Yeah, I lost a, a lot of sleep. But the comfort was to have the full support most outstanding men and women in the federal government, bar none, the men and women of the National Park Service. I stand before you, although I'm a member of the Advisory Council for Preservation, as a private citizen. So I'm not echoing or offering compliments to the men and women of the Park Service in the thousands and thousands of volunteers because what I am saying is something that I know and I have experienced. So you have the Director of the National Park Service who has a large staff, they say don't have enough staff, but roughly 21, 22,000 employees including career permit season, augmented by perhaps now 200,000 volunteers, a large number of partners, concessioners, association, foundation, all given to the preservation of the programs and areas in the park system. It's an awesome responsibility. And the director discharges his or her responsibility through a chain of command, if you will, through regions and parks. I often have to remind people who raise questions about why do you have this park, why don't you get rid of that park? Even though the Director of the National Park Service has awesome responsibilities in terms of budget, probably neighboring between three, $3.2 billion, the large number of employees, 83 million acres of land. There's two things that the Director of the National Park Service is not authorized to do. The Director, even with all that tremendous resources, cannot establish a unit of the National Park System. Nor can he or she divest his or her responsibilities of management. That is an authority held by the President of the United States in terms of exercising his authority under the Antiquities Act in terms of establishing monument, or vested in the powers of Congress to authorize new areas. So when an area is administered to the National Park System, as there's some 20 plus areas here in the state of Maryland, when it is authorized and it is dedicated, the director and his and her staff, his and her staff, has a responsibility to manage that area 
to the best of his ability. There is no category of significance in parks. Every park has been authorized either through the Antiquities Act or through an act of Congress of being something that the American people want to preserve in perpetuity. So I've been known to uh, lose my Texas cool and talk about the crown jewels. Every unit in the national park system is a jewel. That is what the American people expect in terms of adhering to managing those areas. Now we come to the area of great importance to us. That is to recognize that if these resources are to be cared for at the highest standard the benefit as we see of this and future generation. It has to rely on the best talent, skills, dedication, and motivation of people. And that's you, my friends. That's you, my friends. The park service and the national parks have the need of the kind of skills, the kind of dedication that you bring to bear. Although I am <clears throat> without portfolio, I, I would encourage, as you look at the wide array of career opportunities, so to keep in mind your national park service. <laughs> but within, within the areas administered by the Park Service and within the workforce, even including the partners and the volunteers, there is a continuing need to try to achieve to the best of our abilities what I frequently refer to as the face of America. Many of you perhaps are more conversant with the history of the conservation and preservation movement than I. We have not always been faithful with that mantra of achieving the face of America. It is great that we continue to do that. Let me share with you a specific direction, a specific direction. And it's interesting, my friends, That, that when Congress when Congress see a growing interest and in a movement by the American people, they sometimes find that it's necessary to remind those of us in the executive branch that we need to do better by the American people. We are a nation of over 300 million citizens growing every day. And if you were to take a look at the demographics, it is absolutely amazing, refreshing. I think of my home state of Texas no longer a black and white state. Every year we call in my state of Texas. And what that says, my friend, is that any public agency given public trust 
has to be responsive, has to recognize the need of those citizens who has a responsibility to serve. So coming off the major civil rights movement, the rights of those who had different points of view, different sexual orientation, fellow disabled citizens and what have you, in terms of how can the park meet those needs. Congress reinforced that responsibility. And let me share with you the precise language that Congress approved that became public law in 1970. And I quote, though distinct in character, are united through their interrelated purposes and resources into one national park system as cumulative expression of a single national heritage that individually and collectively these areas derive increased national dignity and recognition of their superb environmental and cultural quality through their inclusion jointly with each other in one national park system preserved and managed for the benefit and inspiration, this year, for the inspiration of all the people of the United States. Congress, they wallow on this. All means all. So there is no light of direction from the American people that express the public law that the programs the National Park Service and the areas are to be preserved for the benefit, inspiration of all Americans. Through a number of innovative programs as determined from research, analysis, what have you, which John so eloquently outlined, there is a growing awareness, major accomplishment, in recognizing what their gaps in our services program to meet those needs in those communities that may be predominantly Asian or Latino, African American, women, disabled citizens. Congressman, you serve all the people of or are you coming up short? That's clear. That's clear. I have all of ways sort of made a comparison that if in fact we're making progress in including areas in the park system that speaks to all our chapters and reflecting the heritage, our collective heritage of the various racial, ethnic, women contributions, then does not it follow that the complexion or the face of the men and women of the park service should be the same. And that has not and is not where we need to be today in terms of having the face of America reflected in the parks and the staff. So that requires a great deal of work Look at how we recruit and retain. Look at how we make information available electronically, face-to-face, -face, whatever the case may be. Broaden the opportunity for particularly our young people to become connected with their heritage. And Congress said, what we will do, Park Service, we will give you some new authorities to make that connection. In 1970, Congress authorized the Human <coughs> Conservation Corps that allowed the Parks of the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife, to hire young people at the tender age of 15 to work in parks during the traditional summer year. Again, making that connection. And then when I was the director, Congress authorized the Public Lands Corps 
which directed and gave us authority to enter into partnership with youth serving organizations to bring more young people into the workforce, research, hands-on preservation in the park service. And out of those major efforts have generated a pool, if you will, of applicants for career opportunities. Again, reaching out, branching out to involve our young people. I cannot overemphasize, nor has this been the leadership of the preservation program here in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. I've read some of your material, and I particularly want to commend you on your leadership and how you stress that preservation by design or by definition is interdisciplinary. There's so many disciplines to draw from really get at the heart as to what is required to preserve our heritage. But also in your literature, in your program description, you talk about the contribution that you and your students can make towards achieving that what we call diversity and inclusion, environmental justice. I just want to commend you. I will share with you that based on five decades of being in the vineyard of conservation preservation, and knowing from which we've come, where we are, and we might go, that there are some considerations that can only be acted upon by us as individuals. And if you, as you've studied history, you know that most of the movement for a just cause was born by an individual. There is no question that there is one whose legacy, whose legacy is preserved and commemorated in our national park system has had and continue to have a profound impact on my thinking and I would hope in some small way on my deeds. One who was born into that institution we call slavery on the eastern shore of America became one of America's most prominent advocate for freedom, a prolific writer, and a world-renowned artist, a statesman, a public servant, and that he worked for the government at one time, who recruited African Americans to serve in the Civil War, including two of his sons, Charles and Lewis who described by President Lincoln as one, if not the most meritorious man we ever met. This is what a president is saying about one who was born into that institution called slavery. I speak of none other than Mr. Frederick Douglass. My Mr. Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. Over a hundred years ago, he gave us some thoughts that if we are to come together as people, as a community, as a nation, that we strive towards achieving that noble goal of a more perfect union. He reminded us, he reminded us of what we should understand and value 
of that ourselves and our fellow man and fellow man. In the words of Mr. Frederick Douglass, and I quote, our best and most valued acquisitions have been obtained either from our contemporaries or from those who have preceded us in the field of thought and discovery. We have reaped where others have sown, and that which others have sown, we have given. It must in truth be said that no possible native force of character and no depth or wealth of originality can lift a man into absolute independence of his fellow man. And no generation of man can be independent of the preceding generation. The brotherhood and interdependence of mankind are guarded and defended at all points. I believe in individuality, but individuals are to the mass like waves to the ocean. The highest order of genius is as independent, is as dependent as it is the lowest. It, like the lofty waves of the sea, derives its power and greatness from the grandeur and vastness of the ocean of which it forms a part. We differ as the waves, but are one as the sea. Look at that clearly from Mr. We are different as the waves, but we are one as the sea. There is nothing wrong, in fact, it's beautiful, of the differences that we have, our backgrounds, our education, economic family, family, wealth, pool, what have you. We all bring something to the picture. But when all is said and done, we don't want to We have to understand and appreciate that. We are. So again, in terms of the thrust of the preservation program here, I just want to commend you. Because I think that as your graduates move to different fields of endeavor, that they know that they are representing and preserving us as a people, our legacy as a people. We are one. But when one think about preserving our heritage, I have discovered that the most, if you were to put aside the employees, the most valuable resource entrusted to the care of the National Park Service is simply this, my friends, the truth. The truth. Preservation is about discovering, preserving, and telling the truth. And one who grew up in Texas under the doctrine of separate but equal for 24 years of my life. And during that 24 year period, I could not enter the front door with John in a small cafe where my mother served that I showed up and cooked. For 24 years, here in this great city, that was my set of circumstances under the doctrine of sin. But if I were to read the history books, the textbook, look at the media presentation of the little black and white thing, I would see that the truth was, was not been told about the struggles of African Americans, the contributions African Americans had made. The truth has to The American people has said, Congress, you will enact legislations 
that would provide for the establishment in the National Park Service, that we would perpetually tell the truth that young boys and girls could not have access to quality education. They could not exercise the full measure for the 15th Amendment guaranteeing the right to vote. And this 14th Amendment that talks about equal protection of the law, maybe that's not today, maybe not tomorrow. So the Jim Crow laws and discrimination prevailed in this country. It prevailed most insidiously from, 19, from 1896. Get a little stirred up about this one. When the Supreme Court handed down its decision in Plessy versus Fergus, that is okay. It's the greatest nation on the globe, but it's okay that we can live separately, but presumably equal. So it's okay to have restaurants, water fountains, campgrounds, and natural park for the color and for the white. That was those circumstances existed from 1896 under that Supreme Court. And it was only partially rectified, only partially rectified in 1954 when the Supreme Court declared that we find unanimously in the field of public education the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. But it's only in the field of public education, not parks, not hotels, not theaters. And one would have thought that if the Supreme Court's going to held down a decision that the American people said, Supreme Court, we will adhere to it. But where was our will? Where was our will? in those circumstances, Texas, the substandard. And nine of my contemporaries said that I have the right to quality education in Arkansas, or Arkansas. But the people said, no, nah, you don't. And the Supreme Court said one thing, but another thing will be practiced here. But the young people said that, yes, we have the right to quality education, and we will attempt to enroll at Little Rock Central High School. Where was the will? President Eisenhower said, yes, you have that right. And I will guarantee you access to the school, because I am going to assign military personnel to guard you as you enter the front door of that school in 1957. So in your national parks, we tell the story of Brown versus Board of Education decision. But we also are honest in telling the truth that we did not have the will. We tell the story of the Little Rock Nine at the Little Rock Central High School National Historic Center. Tell that story in perpetuity. We think about what we have brought on American Indians. The Sand Creek Massacre, Battle of Little Big Horn. We talk about the imprisonment, yeah, I call it imprisonment, some say in turn, but imprison our fellow Americans because we thought their loyalty would be to Japan in World War II. We tell that story in perpetuity that Manzanar three or four other internment camps. So people question, why do you tell the painful story? And one of my great heroes, one of our great historians, who served as the chairman of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, pardon me, Advisory Council for the, for the National Park System, the late Dr. John O. Franklin, who loved the National Park, 
Dr. Franklin, in a major speech he gave at a National Park Church Conference in 2006, reminded us that those places that we commemorate or either preserve that represent sad or typical chapters in our history are not places in which we should allow ourselves to wallow in remorse, but rather, but rather be moved to a higher resolve to become better citizens. So when all is said and done, when all is said and done, and then we pursue this noble endeavor of preservation of our heritage, Said and done, the measurement would be have we or are we becoming better citizens? Think about that, my friends. Think about that. That is the bottom line. Are we becoming better citizens? And I would like to, to think so. Let me close. I'll sort of redefine brevity, John. <laughs> <laughs> Let me close because I do want to have some opportunity to enact with you. As I said before, sort of dismiss my people every morning if you energize me. Um, on Friday, on Friday, I will have the opportunity to join with a large number of people in Washington, D.C. <laughs> has re effect of um, you know, re-energized by the enduring legacy, conservation legacy of one of our great leaders. He would have celebrated his 100th birthday last month. A native son of Arizona and into his second and third term as a congressman from Arizona. He was tapped, I think at the tender age of 43, by President Kennedy to serve as his secretary of the Department of the Interior. And upon the very, very, very unfortunate assassination of our president in my home state of Texas, November 22nd, 1963, he was retained by President Johnson to serve out a full eight year tenure as the Secretary of the Interior, the Honorable Stuart Lee Udo. Shortly upon his death, when he was given in Santa Fe, he did not return to Arizona. He had a commitment to try to help the Navajo Indians, whose health has been affected by the drain off from uranium mines in New Mexico. Shortly after his passing, with the leadership of the Congressional Delegation of New Mexico, they were able to pull together a strongly supported by a partisan bill, signed into law by President Obama. So when you go to the Department of the Interior main bill, the 18th and C, or 1949 uh, <coughs> Street, you will go into the Stuart Lee Udall Department of the Interior. And when I think about the conservation legacy of Stuart Udall. I think about who had been my role model. My role model. My inspiration as to what this concept that we talk about of inclusiveness, diversity, 
environmental justice. Two years in advance of the Civil Rights Act of 64, the same year that he swore an office of the Secretary of the Interior, he looked at the workforce of Interior from American Samoa to Romania from Alaska, U.S. Virgin Island, did not see any semblance of the face of America. So he said, I'm going to change this like yesterday. Interior is going to recruit a place where three or four had never recruited, at least on any substantial basis at the historically black colleges and universities located throughout the South. Remember again, there was no federal minimum requirement that he recruit Negro students, as we were called in the school. But he said, I have that conviction. I have that courage to give it. For good, bad, and indifference, I was one to be recruited as a junior. <laughs> to work as a ranger in Grand Teton National National. But he also said that there are many gaps in terms of areas that we are preserving in the National Park System. And when I first joined the Green and Gray and the Stetson Act, Congress had only authorized the commemoration of the legacies of three African George Washington Carver, his birthplace, who went into slavery in Missouri. Booker T. Washington, his birthplace, who went into slavery in my adopted state, Virginia. And Congress had authorized the National Council of Negro Women to construct a memorial on park land in the nation's capital for one of our greatest daughters, Dr. Mary Cloud Bethune. So as I took the oath of my employment in June of 1962, on September 5 of that same year, as a result of the leadership, the work with a large number of organizations that were Congress, President Kennedy signed legislation to public law making the home of my all-time hero, Mr. Frederick Douglass, a unit of the National Park System. Mr. Douglass's legacy continue to encourage, continue to inspire me today. So we will honor the legacy of Secretary Udall. Through his leadership, some 60 areas over that eight year period were added to the National Park System. And he had a love for the performing arts. Wolf Trap Farm National Park for the performing arts was authorized to his team. Sweeping environmental laws, Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Wilderness Act. Well, in St. Rivers, the National Trail System. And yes, the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation was authorized under the National Historic Preservation Act, the Act of 1966, a part of his legacy. So it would be an honor to be with members of the Udall family and conservation leaders from around the world saluting that enduring legacy. And he has a son who serves in the Senate representing New Mexico, Tom Udall. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to commend the leadership of the school program of preservation here at the University of for you have made me feel young again. So I want to salute you in the words of the young president who appointed my hero, Stuart Lee Udall, 
who made my career possible with that initial <coughs> who made possible with the president to sign legislation, placed it in the perpetual care, the legacy of my all-time hero, Mr. Frederick Duff. I will share with you the words of that young president, John F. Kennedy. I am certain, I am certain that when the dust of centuries has passed over our cities, we too will be remembered, not for our victories or defeats, in battles or in politics, but rather, but rather for our contributions to the human spirit. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your contributions. When you have helped my spirit, go with my best wishes and have a fantastic 2020. Thank you very much for that. dissertation at the end of the last administration and filed during the first nine months of this administration, um, I realized how important it was to have champions like you um, in the National Park Service system, particularly as my dissertation had an emerging chapter on your legacy <coughs> and impact as my dissertation uh, focused on the National Park Service Asian American Pacific Islander uh, Heritage Initiative and theme study under the Obama administration to, at that point, we all thought this is just how business is done here in the National Park Service. But we then learned in this administration um, that's not always the case. It varies with every administration. Um, and even more so, in the, uh, last May, uh, there was the announcement under the African American Civil Rights Grant Program um, and the Historic Preservation Fund, which you were a, and continue to be a strong champion for, was the emergence of the underrepresented community civil rights grant, which we all got really excited for. But then I realized that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders were not listed to be qualified to apply for these programs. Native Hawaiians were, but not Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So we turned to the National Trust for Historic Preservation and asked why weren't we included. And I got a response from the senior vice president who said, it's implied in the legislation. As you and I know, nothing's ever implied in legislation. Mm -hmm. So um, we are hoping the next month, uh, when it's brought back to the table under appropriations, that they do include Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, as we have mem several members of Congress watching sure. that legislation. And I was told, uh, actually I was just at Honolulu National Historic Site in Honolulu, this weekend, and we honored a Congressman Ed Case from his district, and we told him we have to make sure that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are always included, uh, along with uh, women, LGBTQ, Latino, yeah. Native Americans. Um, and to that, the Congressman said, we need people, our champions on the ground to make sure we're doing our work right. So I wanted to ask, sorry to long context, but <laughs> <laughs> with your with your legacy and your, and your continued support in diversifying our leadership and our representation in the National Park uh, System, what advice would you give to the students who are still here um, about what is the future of uh, diversity in, um, in the National Park Service and how would you encourage, particularly in this administration, for those who may be afraid to, to you know, 
even apply or see themselves um, as park rangers or working um, at the Department of the Interior? What are some, uh, what would be the advice you would give to them? Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I understand. I, uh, the first book is a season of uh, Kennedy administration. So I've worked in and out of the federal government until the current administration. Uh, I've always been the other side of the house. Um, there will always be some lawyers from one's perspective. Um, what I have found to be true, irrespective of which party is in power in Cuba, is that for those who take a passive uh, stance or position, yet the desire to see something change, they will see it happen. As I said before, in a practical way, a practical approach can be easily determined if the will is there, undergirded by a very strong philosophical opinion, you'll be willing to get into the struggle. As I said before, we can learn what our ancestors have taught, have given us so many lessons, so many lessons. The question is, are we learning from the lessons? And again, I, and I can just say to you this personal reference, but that's home it's made me. If you were to take a look at just the legacy of the Frederick Douglass as an example, a textbook in terms of how to move things over. Take a look at his speech in 1857, six years before the Emancipation Party. Mr. Douglas said, I will give you a word on the philosophy of social reform. All progress is born of very struggle. He further stated that for those who profess freedom and deprecate agitation, are those who want crops without plowing up the ground and a terrain without plowing up the ground. Again, when there's no struggle, there's no progress. The bottom line is sometimes you have to not try to open the door. Sometimes you might have to try to kick it down. Your representative in Congress, your director of the National Park Service, if they don't hear anything, well, they, they accept it. Sometimes you've got to stay in the struggle. You've got to, Mr. Douglas Wood, you got to agitate, agitate, agitate. And I'm just saying it from having been on this planet for some 79 years. That has been my experience. You know, it's interesting about the lessons that are taught. Again, we commemorate the rich legacy and the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And you take a look at his readings and writings and what have you, you sort of have to conclude that is a, a little Frederick Douglass in there somewhere. <laughs> Writing a letter from the Birmingham jail, Dr. King reminded us, admonished us, that we will have to repent in this generation not merely for the evil things that are said by the bad people, but the appalling signs of the good people. So if you feel strong about that, you write to your members of Congress. Get the director to come out saying something about it. Yeah, this is some disparity. I'm not saying that something won't happen, 
but at least you have stayed in the struggle. Not in this administration, but in the future. Stay in the struggle. So I put this on my head. That's true. Others? Do this for me. If I know Michelle, I know you're going to do more than just write a letter, aren't you, Michelle? No, no, I want her to email me, and then I'll ask John to take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm with that portfolio. Uh, <laughs> keep forgetting. Well, sir, I'd like for you to come. Oh, I have a, a training we call a natural resources. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I figured it was for me. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, good. 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 Yes. Hello, I'm Mary Jane LaFrance. I serve for the Historic District Commission for the City of Aethersburg. And there's been a hot button issue for a few years now on to whether to or not uh, remove from cities across the country statues of soldiers and generals from the Confederate Army. Now, earlier you talked about, is it the truth? And I was wondering, since it's such a convoluted issue, what advice would you give on whether they should or should not be removed? That is a uh, ongoing question of debate, not only in your community, but through, uh, through other communities. Some, uh, some communities, some states, some private organizations have taken a stance to remove to a museum or leave it in place and put up a marker and what have you. Uh, I, in terms of a, as I said before, I'm here in the capacity of a private citizen, but I would refer you to a policy statement uh, that was issued by the uh, Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and Independent Federalists that offers for the consideration of, of those who are interested in remove or not remove. It's, you can, you can, you can uh, tap into that policy by, uh, by uh, the website is H, I mean, A C H P dot gov. A C H P meaning Advisory Council of Historic Preservation dot gov. And I think that you would want to review that policy, and it has various options that, uh, that uh, one can see. Within the national park system, there are a large number of statues. Take as an example the NASA's National Battlefield Park. Can I go into it? That was a battle, the first battle of 911 by the Confederate, but the second battle <laughs> was won by the Confederate. And as you would imagine, there were some large equestrian statues to various general there. That is a park that was authorized you know, by an act of Congress. It was intended to be some commemoration of the Confederacy, whatever. So I would foresee that those statues would remain. But when it boils down to an individual, I have, I have to resolve in my own mind as an individual as to what my perception is. And I could live with a number of options. But I, I would, for me, a stature or a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a built monument as opposed to a natural landscape has to say something to me. And when I go to the memorial to Dr. Mary McLeod Film, the first and only memorial, not only to an African American woman, but to any woman, a poor man in the nation's capital, or to the memorial to Dr. Martin Luther King on the National Mall, or the Lincoln Memorial the FDR or the Vietnam 
what what I what I have experienced and what I want to experience is some encouragement and where necessary. So in my so when I go to Dr. McLeod with Noons no more, or even the home of Fitted Dillards, I seem to hear a question that comes up. The question goes something like this. What are you, no box then, don't be looking around to where John or Cheryl or the dean, I don't want to, no, don't be looking around. We address, I'm addressing this to you, Bob Stan. As if Dr. Bethune is saying that I have given, I have given my very best. I have stayed in the struggle for freedom, for justice, for dignity for all. So the question is, Bob Stan. Yeah, don't be looking at your name. The question is, Bob Stanley, what are you doing to further freedom, justice, and human dignity? I want every monument more to pose that question to me, to encourage me, to admonish me, to do my bit. If it doesn't do that, then something is missing. That's my take. But I will ask you to take a look at the policy statement. That's the, that's the federal government's policy guide. It's advisory, it's not a decision making, because the decision you know, rests with individual states or their political subdivision. Well, I had an opportunity as a citizen to vote on what I thought this one in Rockville should happen to it. And I thought the good compromise was to move the statue to a property that's still located in Rockville that's privately owned yes, yes. and has a connection with that general. It made sense historically for it to be together, and that was my vote. Okay, appreciate appreciate that very much. We probably have time for just one more question. Cheryl, did you have? A Young question? lady in the back. Ah, it's your Misha. Hello. Um, I um, I was wondering, especially based on your experience being recruited in the 1960s for a park ranger. Um, and especially in this new era of um, hypervisuality of equity and social justice and inclusion, how would you, um, what would your comments be to a young person who is, um, may feel that preservation institutions like the NPS may be trying to recruit them as a way to mine their experience as a person of color and specifically into a category of African American, Asian, or Latino, or a woman, or gay, bisexual, lesbian, you know, whatever it may be, and then um, see they see that as okay. Are you just trying to mine my experience for that specific thing? Are you slotting me? And then that's kind of one-dimensional. So if I'm going to help people, like you said, become better citizens, that's just a one-dimensional story of who I am and how. I experience life and how other people experience life. How would you encourage them not only to, or what would you, what would your comments be to them um, on how these institu institutions um, confront diversity in those ways and how they can further expand that ideology or something like that? Well, the question is, how the individual student or prospective job applicant or business partner can move into a different arena that beautiful, maybe Latino, black, gay, straight, whatever, have not been in before? Yes, and then, but also how, basically, do they see how, what would your comments be to them if they feel like that's what the <laughs> if, they, if they believe that, if, they, if they're if they seeing that, not just because of the institution, but a lot of other practices across the board and society in general, as if they're, um, they're being mined for that one experience, how would you encourage them or comment to them or talk to them about broader opportunities 
in the National Park Service that not only looks at the one dimension of them, but multiple well, dimensions in order for them to encourage people to be better citizens on those multiple dimensions. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, in the context of, of, of the National Park Service and the National Park System, uh, when an employee, when an individual is, is recruited and appointed to a position with the National Park Service, while that person may be recruited for a position at Antietam or Fort McHenry, CNO Canal, Eric Tutman, whatever, here in the state of Maryland, that individual has to recognize that he or she is not signing up only to work at that park in that particular function. They are an employee of the National Park Service. So there will be occasion where if they have tremendous skill in a certain function, they may be asked to consider a lateral real sign, you know, front foot by carrying it to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Not a bad place to go, by they have to feel comfortable in themselves. Or they have to feel comfortable that they will get some support from others in a new location. And take that opportunity to move out of a place that could be called a comfort zone. And we have unfortunately suffered some difficulty. I still said we, the National Park Service suffered and is suffering some difficulty in encouraging that level of mobility of individuals going into an environment where they do not find anyone who has the same cultural values, or same background, same experience as they have. But we try to encourage up front, you are signing up with the National Park Service and your skills, your abilities may be better employed somewhere else. And and, and the young people begin to take another look at that. And certainly with today's uh, technology and communication, they can stay in touch with whomever they will in an instant. Um, but what I discovered early on in my career is that you know, Secretary Udall had a lot of courage before the civil rights force of placing, of placing black faces in parks and communities where they've never seen a range of this beautiful production. Uh, some of us were warmly accepted as new employees, some were really tolerated. But what I discovered there in Grand Tito, and what was the most impactful experience I had, not to witness those magnificent snow-capped mountains each morning, or see the moose forging in a small crystal lake, or the beauty of Jackson Lake, generally, what have you. But what was most impactful to me quality of the professional staff willing to share with me some of the ropes of the trade, if you will, how to master my position. And this is what I try to encourage young people. There are so many people who are willing to help you on your life journey. But you have to take some initiative to reach out and sometimes to ask for help. And they will be surprised as to how many people will go that extra mile to support young careers. But you got to show them initiative. So we do have you know, Latino women, gay, lesbian, what have you, working in remote areas where you never thought that they may be willing to move out of a metropolitan area or from their own community. Not to the degree that one would hope for, but it's happening, it's happening. And I would just underscore this as a principle to each of you in your young career. 
there's a lot of people out there who are willing to give you some help. But sometimes you've got to take that first step. You've got to take that initiative to connect. And that, that will happen. Okay. Thank you again, Dr. Stanton. I think we're at the end of our time. Okay, good. Thank you very much.